Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the last session of talks. I know everyone's tired and tired of hearing talks, so thanks for sticking it out all the way to the end with me. Uh, as we said, this is real life accessibility. Have you heard your site? And we're gonna get into what exactly that means in a little bit. First, a brief introduction. Uh, my name, as you said, is Mike Herring. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I work at a company called American Well. We are a telehealth provider. Uh, you might have seen our competitors out in the hall, Doctor in Demand. So, uh, hey guys, how's it going? Um, and you can reach me at any of these places. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't do Twitter. I've tried. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Um, but any of those work just fine. So, uh, I consider myself somewhat of an accessibility expert, but this wasn't always the case. Uh, years ago, just like most of you, I was working professionally as a web developer and knew next to nothing about accessibility. Okay, so it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and I really wouldn't call myself an expert. I'm learning just like everyone else. Uh, but the good thing is I can say it's a lot easier than you might think it is, and it doesn't take that much effort to make meaningful improvements in your web content. So what do, why does accessibility matter? And I'd like to start this off with a little quote. He stands like a statue, becomes part of the machine, feeling all the bumpers, always playing clean. How do you think he does it? I don't know. What makes him so good? This, of course, is from Pinball Wizard by The Who. And I was listening to this in the car on Monday on the way downtown to get some beers, and I was thinking, yeah, how does he do it? If you're not familiar with the story, uh, this song is about a, a blind and deaf boy named Tommy who's able to become a pinball champion. How is he able to do this? Well, if you listen to the song, it spells it out for you. He's able to use tactile response. He's able to feel the vibrations in the machine, feel the impact of the bumpers, and know where the ball is at all times. And I thought, this is incredible. What an amazing, accessible piece of 1960s technology. Um, so a quick, quick little side note. Uh, who in here, and I'm assuming most people, has built a website or manages a website? OK, most people, because we're Django developers, right? OK, now wait, keep your hands up. Now, keep your hands up if you think Tommy, the blind deaf boy from the song, would be able to use your website, navigate it, find information as easily as someone who's fully sighted, and yeah, that's what I thought. That is the issue that we have to resolve. Uh, so of course, Tommy is not a real person, but there are a lot of real people out there, real customers, real users, who we do need to consider when it comes to accessibility. Uh, as alluded to in a previous talk, I think I got slightly different statistics from a different website, but about 12.8% of Americans have some sort of severe disability, and that is a huge number. Not only that, but according to CDC, these numbers are increasing. Actually, I should say, I should edit this to say these percentages are increasing. It's not just numbers increasing because population is increasing. Percentages are increasing as our population ages. As, we be, uh, as our life expectancy grows, we have a higher percentage of senior citizens, and right along with that, we have a higher number of people who are suffering from some sort of disability. The CDC estimates uh, around 3% of Americans are legally blind, and that number could double to almost 6% in the next three decades. That is a huge number of people that we might be missing out on. All right, gonna do another pop quiz. Who here, uh, in the past year or so, has dealt with uh, an IE bug? Internet Explorer, right? Something doesn't work right in IE 11 or something lower than that. Right, most people have, I deal with it, it's an issue. Uh, how many people have dealt, uh, dealt with an issue dealing with visual impairedness, right? Someone can't use the site because they can't see, they can't operate it. A couple, awesome, great. Not as many as IE11, which is interesting because IE11 usage is at 3%, same number as the number of blind people in the United States. I see this as a problem. Uh, I, I don't see why we are not spending as much time and energy on accessibility problems as we are on IE11. IE11 people have a choice. They were not born using Internet Explorer. <laughs> they don't have a medical condition preventing them from switching browsers. I think we need to shift our priorities. Of those people uh, who are disabled, Pew Research indicates that 23% say they never even go online. And only 39% say that they feel confident in their ability to navigate and find information online. We, as web developers, should be ashamed of those numbers. And we should be doing everything we can to make the web a more accessible place for everyone, not just people who can see and hear. Uh, additionally, a survey done by webaccessibilityinmind.org uh, uh, of people who actually use assistive technology to browse the web, 43% said the, the biggest issue they face, uh, or the biggest blocker uh, in their opinion, to having more accessible content on the web is simply lack of awareness by content providers and by web developers. That's us. 
Additionally, 85% said, given the choice between uh, getting more accessible content and getting more sophisticated assistive technology that could read and understand websites, they said uh, it would be more helpful if we just made more accessible content. The tools they're using are fine, it's us that is the problem. So we need to take this as a personal challenge. Do I really have to? Uh, when I talk to people about accessibility, often I get a lot of groans and you, the, ty the type of voice that you hear when you tell someone they have to write more unit tests or documentation or they have to support IE11. Uh, so if you're one of those people, I have two things to tell you. First of all, it is the right thing to do. If you don't believe me, please refer to yesterday's talk on ethics and engineering. Uh, but also, it is the law. That's right, you have to do this in most cases. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about US laws specifically, but I know there are analogous laws in the UK and other places in the world. Uh, if you're familiar with accessibility, you've probably heard the phrase Section 508. That refers to an amendment of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which uh, applies to all web content produced by federal agencies. There's also the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Uh, this is why we have wheelchair accessible ramps uh, in public buildings. This also applies to websites run by businesses. And uh, according to all these regulations, you have to make your web content accessible to disabled users. Now you're probably thinking, oh, but do they really check? How serious is this? Yes, they do. Hotels.com, Expedia.com, Target.com have all been the target of lawsuits related to either Section 508 or the ADA. And your small business could be next. It's not just the big players in this field. Uh, I was just talking to someone on Monday who had a client, a small business, they were building a website for them. They got hit by uh, a lawsuit related to ADA. There are law firms out there that are actively searching for small businesses with non-compliant websites. So the moral of the story is, yes, be afraid, they are coming for you. All right, so now if you're convinced that you need to do something about your site, how do you do this? Well, the W3C is here to save the day. This is the uh, World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, these are the friendly people who uh, publish the HTML specifications. They have a subgroup called the Web Accessibility Initiative, or WAI, who have created even more acronyms. They have the WCAG, or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and WAI ARIA, or Accessible Rich Internet Applications. I'm gonna go briefly over both of these. I don't have time to get really deep into it, by, but I implore you to go online and try reading them. Let's talk about WCAG. Uh, this is organized into four main points about web content accessibility. Your content should be perceivable, and this means perceivable by anyone or anything. Uh, this could mean providing alternatives to text, uh, sorry, uh, providing text alternatives to images, to videos, to audio. Uh, it could also mean choosing a color scheme so that people with low vision or people with color blindness can read your text. Uh, did you know that 6% of males in the United States have some sort of green weak color blindness? So maybe consider that next time you validate a form and you switch the continue button from gray to green. That might mean nothing. Um, not only does it need to be perceivable, but it needs to be operable. And there's lots of points under this. Go read about it. The main one is, though, can you operate this uh, website using only a keyboard, not a mouse? It's more difficult than you might think. Your content needs to be understandable. This seems obvious, uh, but if it's really complicated, you should uh, explain any acronyms. You should explain complicated jargon. Your website should behave in a predictable manner. You should tell your users what language it's in. And finally, it needs to be robust. In this case, meaning using well-formed HTML and markup, using tags efficiently so that assistive technology can interface with it. That slide was kind of dry, so here are my pets. Um, I would like you to imagine, though, that their adorable faces are imploring you to go read the WCAG. It's long, it's riveting, uh, and take those guidelines to heart. Something buried in the guidelines is this phrase. Following the guidelines will often make your web content more usable to users in general. I thought this was kind of snarky on behalf of the uh, WCAG authors, but it's true. Think about it. Making your content easier to navigate, easier to read, easier, uh, easier to understand is going to help everyone, not just people with disabilities. All right, so we want to follow these guidelines. How do we do it? Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's talk about HTML 2.0. This came out in 1995. It is 23 years old, and we are still doing it wrong. So let's talk about some things. Let's talk about alt tags. If you've ever dealt with any accessibility issues, you've probably gotten missing alt tag, warning, a thousand times. 
please provide alt tags for your images. This is a short piece of text that can stand in for your image. Uh, and if you ask someone traditionally, what's the point of this? They might say, oh, it's in case your image can't load. Well, nowadays you say, oh, that's not an issue. I use S3. S3 will never go down. Um, <laughs> but it's not just about uh, not being able to load the image. Maybe you're just not going to load the image. Maybe you're using a Braille interpreter for the site. That's not going to show an image. You need to have something in its place. Uh, and please tell your marketing representatives to avoid stuffing this full of SEO and marketing gibberish. This is not the place for it. Uh, tab index, and again, these are things that have been around for a long time uh, and are still not being used correctly. Tab index, uh, when you reach a website, you hit tab, you can cycle through all the links and buttons on the page. Tab index tells you what order to do it. Uh, normally nowadays, just set it to zero. All right? That tells the browser, go through it in order uh, that it appears in the DOM. Uh, now this is important. If you're doing tricky CSS, you're floating it over here, you're positioning it down there, uh, tab doesn't care. It's going to go in the order it appears in the DOM. So keep that in mind. But this is necessary for people who are using a keyboard for navigation rather than a mouse. You can also set it to negative one to skip the element. Why would you do that? Uh, a common example is the file upload uh, element. Most people are familiar with that. It's ugly. You can't style it. So you move that ugly duckling off the side of the margin and you put a nice shiny image in the middle that has an on-click event that fires that. Great. Uh, but if you don't set the tab indexes correctly, your browser might try to focus that ugly duckling that's off the screen and not the image that you really want. So make sure you set those correctly. H1 to H6, this is really important. If you don't remember anything else about this talk, remember headings, all right? Organize your document like a tree using headings and subheadings. Usually it's recommended to have one H1 that has the title of your page and don't skip levels. You don't put an H3 under an H1, you don't start your page with an H2, it doesn't make any sense. That same survey that I talked about before from WebAM, uh, users who use assistive technology said the number one thing they use for navigating content is headers or headings. Uh, and if they're well structured, it makes it really easy to navigate. So do it right. Before I go to the next slide, uh, so when this slide comes up, I want everyone to look at it. Don't blink, stare at it for two seconds, and then we're going to read it slowly together. Ready? I need a yes. Yes, okay, here we go. H1 doesn't mean big text. Please stop doing this. And H6 doesn't mean small text. They have semantic meanings. H1 means a level one heading. H6 means a level six heading. You probably won't have a lot of those on your page. Uh, please don't confuse these with formatting tags like bold or center. Uh, we should be avoiding using those anyways. This brings me to my next topic, semantic HTML. Uh, this is just a fancy word for any tags in HTML that describe what an element is, not how it should be displayed. We use semantic HTML to avoid uh, this horrible condition known as div soup. When you view the source of a page and it's just a div inside a div inside a div inside a div inside a div, inside a div and you don't know what any of them mean. Uh, well, if you have CSS, a, a user visually can see what all of those mean, uh, but you as the developer and also uh, from an accessibility standpoint, it just looks like a pile of divs. So use semantic HTML, mark things as headings, as paragraphs, use the new HTML tags uh, for headers, articles, footers. This will help the accessibility API know what to do with your page. Now accessibility API, that is a layer that stands between your site and any assistive technology like a screen reader or a braille interpreter. Uh, the accessibility API looks at your site tries to figure out where the major sections are, where your content is, uh, et cetera. And if you're using semantic tags, it makes it a lot easier. But there are ways to tweak it, which brings me back to ARIA. We talked, mentioned that briefly a minute ago, Accessible Rich Internet Applications. This is a set of attributes and tags you can use in your markup to tell the accessibility API how to interpret it. Uh, most importantly uh, is ARIA roles. ARIA roles are a way to basically disguise one element as another. So say that uh, file upload button we were talking about. We hid the real button, and we had an image that was acting as a button. It was assuming the role of a button. But we hadn't told the accessibility API that it was a button. To it, it just looked like an image. So we need to set role equal to button in order for that to work. There are all kinds of different roles. I'm not going to dive deep into it. Go look it up online. Uh, but you can specify, for instance, I want to use this image as a section heading. So set it equal to heading and set the level of the heading. Alerts, dialogues, menus, etc. 
Besides roles, there are also a lot of ARIA attributes. Again, I'm not gonna dive deep into any of these. There are a lot of them, go check them out. But these uh, tell the accessibility API things about elements on your site that normally you would indicate through maybe a change of color. This is no longer disabled. Or uh, an icon, this arrow means you can expand or collapse this element. Or uh, this element has a pop-up when you click on it. These things uh, are not readily evident if you're just looking at the markup, all right? It makes sense if you have CSS and you're looking at it visually. So you can use these ARIA properties to get that across. Another important one is ARIA hidden. Use ARIA hidden if this is an element, maybe it's just a little graphical flourish, it's not really part of the content, it doesn't need to be represented in any text form, so just hide it. All right, so we've, uh, let's say we've done all the work, we've set up our headings, we've done all our alt tags, we think we're ready to go, Time to check our site and make sure it actually works. Now there are a number of automatic checkers you can use. The W3C has a huge list of them. Many of those links are not even broken. Uh, a checker is one that I've used. It works pretty well. There are lots of browser extensions. And you're gonna go back and forth with these checkers many times before you get rid of all the warnings. But hopefully you end up with 100% passing. You'll get a little badge you can put on your website. 100% WCAG 2.0, AAA compliance, you feel great about yourself, pat yourself on the back and you're done, right? No, you're not done. Uh, I know because I tried that. My boss said, we're gonna make the website accessible. I said, great, I did that much research. I did all my alt tags, it passed inspection. And then I was sitting in a meeting with my boss, his boss, and an accessibility consultant on the other end of the phone who was using just a keyboard and a screen reader to navigate our site gave him the URL, he dialed it up, and then there was silence. And then he said, hmm, and that is not good. And he said, is there supposed to be some sort of navigation or menu element on your site? And my heart just kind of dropped down to here because I was the main developer for this. Uh, yes, there was supposed to be a navigation and he couldn't find it. Once we got him to find it, he wasn't able to open it up. Uh, once he was, the links in there didn't make any sense. So after this complete embarrassment, I decided it was time to get real. I decided it was time to unplug the mouse, put on my headphones, open up a screen reader, and you can get one of these for free. If you have a Mac, uh, VoiceOver comes for free. Use Chrome, there's a Chrome plugin that comes for free. And actually sit down and try to do what this person was doing and try to actually navigate the site. So, let's try it. Uh, let me see if I can do this really quickly. Displays. Arrangement mirror. Are you looking at my screen? Yes, okay, cool. So, and this should work. Let's start. So this is gonna be a little bit unfair. Um, I wanted to look at DjangoCon 2018, uh, but I didn't have a lot of time uh, for this presentation, so I decided to skip over that, because actually, uh, congratulations to the DjangoCon web devs, it passes inspection pretty well. So I'm gonna to go to something a little bit more embarrassing. They still have online DjangoCon 2009, when things were all about gradients and we thought the matrix was really cool. So let's load up our voiceover application and see what it sounds like. VoiceOver on Chrome, home vertical line DjangoCon, Google Chrome, mic, window, home vertical line DjangoCon, web con in home vertical line DjangoCon, web content, slash logo.png, image. Okay. September 8th to 12th, 2009, Portland, Oregon. List six items. Visited. Link. Home. I did for about You are two currently weeks. on a link. Visited. It was link. painful. About. Link. Log. Link. Conference. Link. Wiki. Link. Contact. This one's fun. End of list. Link. HTTP. Colon slash slash. djangacon 09eventbritecom Slash. Okay. You are link. Talk. That's not you are current cool. heading level two, two items. Welcome to. DjangoCon. DjangoCon is a Django conference that aims to bring together the com right. voiceover off. Enough of that. So let's talk about what we just experienced. Uh, this is really difficult, and I encourage all of you, go home, don't do it right now, uh, but try this. Load up a website, maybe one that you manage, or maybe just any old one, and try to actually go through it just using your keyboard and a voiceover application. It is difficult. It is frustrating. Uh, but it will bring to light a lot of things that you can fix that you probably didn't even realize before. Now, uh, that logo, it didn't have any alt tags, so it just said slash logo.png, not terribly helpful. Uh, the navigation worked pretty well. It, it, there, it wasn't using the nav HTML5 element, uh, so we, it didn't actually say navigation, but we knew it was a, a list of links. This register link obviously was not helpful unless you picked up, oh, event 
uh, Eventbrite, and you knew it was register. Link talk doesn't tell us anything. Uh, and then I get to an H2 called Welcome to DjangoCon. Sounds like the beginning of the page, but it's not an H1, so I feel like I might have missed something. So overall, not a great score for DjangoCon 2009. Um, but you might say, that's unfair, that's not a modern site, we didn't know about these things. Yes, we did, remember, HTML 2.0 came out in 1995. But let's go to something more modern and see what that sounds like. Amazon. Uh, if, I, uh, if someone asked me, hey, could you please read Amazon.com to me, I would probably panic and throw up a little bit. I can barely navigate Amazon even uh, as, you know, my only disability is a slight astigmatism, and I can't find anything on here. But let's just see what it sounds like. Voice over on Chrome, Amazon.com, online shopping for electronics, apparel, computers, books, DVDs, and more. Google Chrome, mic, window, navigation, link, link, open menu. That's not you are currently menu. on a link, Amazon, link, prime, Okay. search. You are currently in a search, all. You are currently on a text element. All what? All departments. Oh. Search in, collapsed, go. Go. You are currently, go, button. So go and go. Search. Okay. search. You are oh, currently, right search, edit text, end of search. Okay. Deliver to Michael. You are currently on a text element, Weston 02122. That's where I live. You I are know currently on a link, N. Link N. You are okay. currently, visited, link. I'm going to skip Hello. ahead to the best Michael, part. Michael, link, 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 link. Click to call our disability customer support line or reach us directly at 1 888 283 1678. That's Voice right. Over off. That is the dev saying, We know it's a hot mess, just call the hotline. Uh, and honestly, I'm tempted to use the hotline too because I honestly can't figure out how to cancel Showtime. All right. <laughs> Let's check out Mezzanine. Uh, if you're not familiar with Mezzanine, it's another CMS similar to Django CMS and Wagtail. Uh, and the great thing about Mezzanine is uh, if you set it up with the, the demo site, it uses, uh, they put together some default templates which are really out of the box, very accessible. And part of this is because uh, they are using uh, bootstrap templates and bootstrap components. If you want a crash course in how ARIA roles and ARIA attributes work, go check out the bootstrap components. They have it set up really nice. Uh, all of their menus, their modals, their buttons, they all use uh, these attributes really well. So let's see what mezzanine sounds like. And this is just a basic default setup. Voice over on Chrome. Blog vertical. In blog vertical line mezzanine. Web content. Navigation. Great. Tells us there's a navigation. You are currently right on a navigation. Visited. Link. Mezzanine. An open source content management platform. Search. Search. Edit text. Everything. Collapsed. Pop up button. Oh, tells us it's a collapse. You are currently menu. on. Go. Button. End of search. Very List five clear. items. Visited. Link. Home. Link. About. Visited. Link. Log, link, gallery, link, contact, end of list, end of navigation, heading level one, log. Starts with an H1. You are currently on a heading level one, inside of web content. To exit this web area, press con right. voice over off. I'm going to cancel it there just so that we can let our ears rest for a second. Um, but the uh, overall, I would say Mezzanine does a great job. If you're looking to try to start up a very accessible Django application, try Mezzanine. Uh, look at what the app, look at what the templates are like, try to extend them or style them, or at least see what they're like. All right, uh, I am just about out of time here. A call to action for all of you. I want you to build accessible websites. So with that in mind, can everyone please raise their right hand? Put it over your heart and repeat after me. I, your name, don't do that, don't do that, do that. Do solemnly swear to make the web a more accessible place for everyone. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's the end.